I see people who come in to me with low copper or low vitamin A, I know that they're very sick. Is copper an essential nutrient? I will put it this way. The people in the program who are finding that copper is one of their biggest issues. It seems that it's taking a lot longer to detox the liver of copper than it is to detox it of vitamin A. As we damage the liver more and more, so then you start accumulating more toxins and maybe something that you weren't exposed to too much before. The funny thing is, is I see vitamin A toxicity and copper toxicity together all the time. When we go and we look at the research on birth control pills, since 1975, it has been known that birth control pills will raise vitamin A in the blood and copper in the blood together. The most interesting thing about copper to me is that copper excess, if it gets sufficient enough, actually creates psychopathy in a person. Depression, psychosis, the desire to end oneself, and schizophrenia are all associated with vitamin A as well. You know, I said vitamin A toxicity and copper toxicity come together. I tell people I don't, I wouldn't have to have a vitamin A test on anybody to help them get better from vitamin A toxicity. It doesn't change what I do. But like in terms of copper, if you go back to eating like chocolate and a vegan, your copper is gonna go right back up. It's like saying, well, I used to be an alcoholic and I stopped drinking for 10 years. What's gonna happen if I drink again? Well, you're gonna get messed up again. So in today's episode, I'm so happy to be able to welcome back Dr. Garrett Smith. Uh, he is a licensed naturopathic medical doctor. Uh, he has a Bachelor of Sciences in Physiology and Nutrition, and he's worked in the medical field for over 15 years. He's also the creator of the Nutrition Detective uh, website and the Love Your Liver program, uh, which I'm sure will come up and which I would highly recommend. Um, so thank you so much for coming back on the podcast, Garrett. Absolutely. Thanks for having me back. In the last podcast, I really enjoyed it. We talked about lots of subjects that I'm already very familiar with your take on, uh, like toxic bile theory, vitamin D3, um, and v vitamin A to some degree, and lots of other things. And I would highly recommend people check out that podcast. It was very popular. But in today's episode, um, Dr. Smith, I wanted to shift focus actually to uh, ask you questions about a topic that I don't fully up know and understand your take about so it'll be a bit more like i'm discovering and understanding with the audience um and the first thing i wanted to get into if it's okay is the subject of copper and so i've got a couple of reasons for this so first of all because when i see you have a lot of very um enthusiastic followers on uh, social media platforms and when I see them talk about stuff, the number one topic they seem to talk about is like having a diet that's low in vitamin A, but also low in copper. That seems to be like the thing that they're really focused on. Now, I haven't actually seen, I'm sure that there's live streams that I've missed on this, but I don't see it as like being a big cornerstone of your Love Your Liver program. So I'm not as familiar on your take on copper and why it's, you know, why at least your followers seem to think it's like, you know, top two most important thing to focus on. Um, and I'm also interested from a personal point of view because... Um, you know, I, I do quite in, extensive uh, testing and I got some uh, results back recently that my copper, I'm just looking it up now to make sure I don't get it wrong. Yeah, plasma copper was right at the bottom of the reference range. So 75.4 micrograms per deciliter. So if I took that to, and, uh, you know, conversely, zinc was actually very high in the reference range. Selenium was very high in the reference range. Magnesium was in the middle. So I know if I took that to a conventional functional medicine practitioner, they'd be, oh, you need to have some copper, right? So I guess the first question is, um, is there such a thing as a copper deficiency? Oof. So now, because I might be close if there is. Well, That's why I'm personally curious. Well, if you were to go and look up copper deficiency symptoms, I would bet you wouldn't find that you have any. So... I mean, did you do that? Yes, I know like um, anemia is one of the things that they, low sex drive, I certainly don't have that. Um, I mean, graying of hair, some people blame that on low copper and I am starting to have that on the beard. So yeah. I have an interesting thought on, so what I've seen, well, one thing that normally happens with Love Your Liver program people, and we have testimonials of this all the time. I was actually just noticing and um, a friend of mine was noticing that my, my beard had recently gotten thicker and darker. And we are very, like, we're not, so the, 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 the 
the main idea about gray hair is that it's somehow a copper deficiency. And we definitely, we see people's hair darkening regularly on the program. And we don't push copper. And we definitely push lots of what are called copper antagonists like zinc and selenium and molybdenum. So if it was a copper deficiency that supposedly was the root of graying hair, it makes sense that we, I'd be having people going gray all the time. My understanding is more likely to be an excess of hydrogen peroxide that's actually bleaching the hair. I mean, there's, um, there's the, there could be an excess of oxidative processes going on in one spot. Obviously, the, the, one of the things I think of with this is I go, if, if there's multiple mechanisms that are potentially causing something, you know, then it may, those may all be true. We may be able to address multiple ones of them, but we may also not be able to address all of them. I, I tend to also think that it's not like gray hair never happened in, you know, aboriginal cultures or paleo cultures. I mean, gray hair is, I kind of think of some of it, some graying as actually an evolutionary thing to kind of like let everybody know that this guy's been around a long time because elders used to be respected. And that was a way True. of recognizing who'd been around a long time. So I don't think it's like some massive indicator. But copper as a whole, like, I mean, your copper being low and you're not showing low-ish, low normal, right on the, you know, right on the border was kind of what you were saying, right? And you're not yep. exhibiting, Bottle you're not exhibiting copper deficiency symptoms and the pro-copper people would already say you're way too low. And I go, but wait, I help guys fix their testosterone and help fix their skin and fix their libidos. And I help women with all their menstrual stuff and their thyroids and all the pro copper people are saying, you're going to get copper deficient. You're going to, you can't take zinc. It'll de deplete your copper. And I go, that's, that's a nice theory, but it doesn't seem to pan out in the real world. So is there that now this is one thing I have not decided to take a stance on hard because I'm still, I'm, I, I consider myself very open-minded until I get enough information to make a decision. I have not, I mean, we have had people. So you said, you know, on your plasma copper, you said 75-ish, right? I think. Yep. We've had people down to, not, not that we tried to, but I had one person in the program who took, an obs on her own decision, she took an obscene amount of zinc and selenium and molybdenum, if I recall correctly. She drove her copper down to like 12. <laughs> right. <laughs> she got better over time. She, she was, she's very intuitive and she kind of decides on her supplements day to day as she feels it. And I could be wrong on the, the selenium. She might not have been taking a lot of that, but it was definitely zinc and molybdenum. And, and she got way down. This is a woman who had a copper IUD before, which I would like to point out early on that they're putting a piece of copper wire into women's cervixes and it is making them infertile. That's not a good sign. <laughs> That's not a good, like, are they going to be copper deficient? No, definitely not. Now, the thing about blood tests with copper, it's very much like with vitamin A. Vitamin A is mentioned over and over in the research by anybody who, who understands vitamin A is that the blood levels do not reflect the liver storage of it. As in people can be extremely high in the liver storage of vitamin A and be very low in the blood. I showed a very specific study on this where a guy was taking some obscene amount of vitamin A pills. They didn't mention his diet, but I bet he was trying to eat lots of vitamin A foods and his vitamin A in his blood was low. They decided, the doctor somehow decided that this guy was vitamin A toxic. So they took him off vitamin A foods. They took him off the supplements. They got him to eat more protein in his diet, which probably also raised his zinc intake, right? Because more meat would tend to raise your zinc. And his vitamin A within eight weeks went from low to high. When he stopped eating it. <laughs> so he started dumping it out of his liver. And it was coming, it was leaking into his blood, which we, if you want to know about that whole thing, that's toxic bile theory. We went over that the last podcast, so I'm not going to rehash it here today. However, one thing I, I just posted on Twitter the other day that I was going to do this, I was going to start going and looking into copper liver biopsy studies because the blood and the liver are not necessarily the same. 
Actually, somebody on Twitter today said that one of the biggest mistakes modern medicine has possibly done is relying on blood tests as opposed to tissue markers. Because tissues are where the magic happens. The blood is like short term, but the tissues are the long term. And nobody's looking at tissues. So, so now things that you may have been doing, like you're saying your, your health is overall doing pretty well. You know, all the things that are associated with general health. And you've been definitely taking, about the last few years, you've been taking zinc, right? And your zinc is towards the high end of normal, right? And your zinc is towards the low end of normal. And you're seeing your health situation generally stay good or improve. So what we're seeing is that antagonizing cop. Well, so what, what does zinc antagonize? What does zinc fight back against? It fights back against vitamin A and it fights back against copper. So interesting that one mineral attacks both of these. It also helps you get rid of cadmium. It also helps you get rid of lead and um, mercury and arsenic and zinc does so many things. I feel so bad for the people out there trying to fear monger about zinc. Can people take too much? Of course they can. Like you can drink enough water to kill yourself. That's not an argument. Like don't overdo anything. That's not good for you. Like, do we have to have like a brain trust about this simple idea? Um, but some, some people out there are pushing really, really high dose of zinc. So what the copper thing is very difficult because most people, when you look into even a crap diet, will get plenty of copper in their crap diet. So getting copper deficient according to the normal standards is almost impossible. Like it's really, really difficult to eat less copper than they suggest you get. So copper deficiency is not really happening. And when I see people who come in to me with low copper, when they first come in, if they haven't been doing any of my stuff and they're coming in with multiple health issues, if I ever see somebody come in with low copper or low vitamin A, I know that they're very sick and that this, they, these things are getting stuck in their liver. They're not coming out. The liver does store things. Anybody who tells you that the liver doesn't store anything is just absolutely clueless. I've, I've shown papers from the 1910s where they show that the liver accumulates toxic metals and it accumulates copper and it accumulates all these things. So yeah, don't, don't believe anybody says, go ahead. If I could comment on that, um, I think the distinction there is just about terminology. I think like, does the liver have places it's trying to store things? Maybe not. I mean, an argument can be made for that, but does it accumulate, as you just said, toxicity? Yes, definitely. Obviously it does. As you said, it's like, you know, heavy metals, all kinds of toxins, even mycotoxins and all, you know, um, all these things have been shown to build up in the liver. So I think a lot of time people are just arguing about terms. The bottom line is it accumulates there. Yes, you're absolutely right. And I, I actually tend to try to use the word accumulate too to, 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 to staff that off or to give people the term that they can search on PubMed to see that it does accumulate these things. Because if they go and they search for like liver store cadmium, you're not going to find it. But if you go liver accumulate cadmium then you find it and then you go oh and i mean and what do people think is accumulating in fatty liver probably fatty toxins like we're exposed to all over the place that the liver's making more storage area for it so the thing about copper the the, the hardest thing about copper is and just like vitamin a like i've had issues where people say well you say to eat a zero vitamin A diet. And I say, no, I've never said that. I, I've said the research says that a zero vitamin A diet is impossible and that trying to achieve that would probably cause significant nutrient deficiencies of things that you do need. Like you'd have to do such a purified diet. You know, like, I mean, I've joked about this. People could eat collagen and MCT oil and um, like white sugar. Yeah, they could, white, they could just do these three things, and would it be a zero vitamin A diet? Probably. Does anybody argue that that's a good diet for people? No, that's insanity. Nobody would do that, and nobody would want to eat it. Um, so it's, it's, no one's ever said that a zero vitamin A diet is possible. Not even Grant Jenner, the guy I learned about this from. And, but then a copper diet, to go really low in copper and still eat plant foods is next to impossible. You just can't accomplish it. Um, and even, uh, even meat, red meat has copper and it also has some vitamin A in it. Even though people will say, well, the, the FDA database says that it doesn't have retinol in it. I'm like, I can go show you studies of wild reindeer where they found vitamin A in the red meat of 
the wild reindeer. So it's definitely in cows that they're feeding grass or feeding vitamin A supplements to. I don't know why they don't find it. It's either incompetence or maliciousness, one of the two, but it's it's happening. So we get into, so copper with, uh, so this is actually, this is one of the reasons why I find that the all muscle meat carnivore diet, not, not organ meats, not yo- egg yolks, not, or not, not pork, not dairy, but an all muscle meat carnivore diet. People actually do pretty darn well on that for a long time often, because that is as low a vitamin A diet and a copper diet as someone can do. And it's also very high in zinc. What a coincidence we found these patterns and it's obviously plenty of protein. So we see that, but then also sometimes these long-term muscle meat carnivores, we're actually seeing now in the social media world, a lot of the big time muscle meat carnivores. Well, first of all, there are no long-term organ meat carnivores. They all give up. They all quit. Like as, as Judy Cho, who I've been on her podcast before, that was a really popular one. She specifically pointed out that all the people who had been doing all muscle uh, carnivore for 10 to 15 years already, they were all, all muscle meat. That's, they did not do organs. They did not do eggs. They did not do dairy. They did. They generally didn't do pork. So we see a pattern there that organ meats knock people off. Well, what is liver really high in if you eat a lot of it? Copper and vitamin A. So it, the, the, all those foods that I mentioned that they're not doing are high in vitamin A. So it would break people over time. Okay. So then we get into the all muscle meat thing. And yes, it's, it's high in protein, high in zinc, low in copper, low in vitamin A. That is desirable. The, the issue is, is I believe that we as humans are, whether you want to say created or designed or however you choose to think about it is we are omnivores. People can are, you know, people on both sides of the argument, they want to say, well, we're, we're designed as carnivores. And the other side can look at different things in our physiology and say, we're designed as herbivores. And I just kind of go, well, we have designs of both and, and we can pretty much live and eat almost anywhere on the planet. So why are we not omnivores again? Now there, there, there's better and worse arrangements of foods, especially for various different, you know, um, how do we want to say it? Genetics of people where they developed, right? But the basics are to your gut biome, the bacteria in your gut. Certain types of them need, especially the bifidobacteria, need either carbs or soluble fiber to, to feed on to survive. They break those down into short-chain fatty acids. They feed the gut lining, all that, all that wonderful stuff. So what I've seen is like that. This is why I think some of the long-term muscle meat carnivores are starting to crack and now they're adding fruit to their diet. Because what does that bring in? Well, it brings in carbs and soluble fiber, which is feeding their gut biome, which then helps them not make as much toxic bile due to their gut biome changing and also helps them to poop out more toxic bile because an all muscle meat carnivore diet is not going to poop out much of anything at all, which means you're not pooping out your bile either. So this is and just to go back yes. for a second to think about the all muscle meat carnivore or the carnivore in general. That's also an extremely ketosis diet, right? And because you're not having any carbohydrate. So my understanding is that you do have to raise, stress chemicals have to be raised in order to be in a state of ketosis. The two go together. So that's something that's maybe not uh, sustainable very long term, uh, except among the very, I don't know, resilient who are maybe best, you know, there are some genetic variants that means that people are very good at breaking down stress chemicals and it's less of an issue for them. Um, mm. But I can see, again, I agree with the carbs point. It seems to me that so, I'm a bit on the fence with fiber because there's a lot of evidence that fiber is not necessarily uh, always beneficial as well. There's I, mean, I agree both with sides. That. I agree with the, not yeah. always. Absolutely. We, and you know, I adjust for that in the program. I always, I always yes. adjust that, but keep going. Yeah. But it seems to me that a long term of our carbs is, as you say, often usually not sustainable. Yeah. I, I, let me add some, there's a funny thing I have about ketosis. And when people say, you know, you can, you want to burn protein and fats for carbs, you know, cause you have to have glucose, right? I have a joke. It's, um, what happens when you run out of ketones? No, nothing. What happens when you run out of glucose? Uh, you die. <laughs> Coma and death. 
So we start going, which one is a survival food or a bonus food? And which one is the one necessary to live? Oh, so if the body will break down protein and fat to get glucose, then we obviously know that the body is going to stress and strain to make glucose. And it's if you can just eat some carbs. Isn't like, why are we trying to make our body be terribly inefficient, right? And, and feed it stuff that it then has to con- use energy to, and resources to convert. So, and then, then you don't get to feed your, your bifido. And the funny thing about like, you know, we generally think of children, babies and that stuff. That's generally most people remember when they were young, they were healthier, right? And it is known that bifido bacteria populations generally go down. They're the highest when we're born, assuming a, a vaginal birth. And then they slowly just ramp down as we age. Okay, well, what if we take on diets that specifically just crush the bifido? That's not going to go well. I mean, why would we associate youth and health and higher bifido levels? I mean, it, it's, it's there. It's not the only thing that determines it, but it's just one of many things. Um, and one of the things that, the, that, that not eating carbs will tend to cause is what's called a putrefactive um, dysbiosis in the gut where... where putrefaction, rotting meat. That's what meat does. It putrefies. And we don't want that because, well, that's, it's just, you know, stuff's going to happen in your gut, but you don't want it severely imbalanced. You, you want some sort of balance in there and different people may need more meat and less plant foods. And some people may need less plant foods and more meat. What we found the best thing to do for the all muscle meat carnivores who want to keep doing that because, you know, maybe they say, well, I feel really good on it, but something's just not right. Well, then we just start working in some soluble fiber as they tolerate it could be, you know, if they want really pure fiber and no food, we're looking at psyllium, we're looking at, um, apple pectin, but if they want to start eating some apples here and there, then they do that. It's not really, it's not that hard. And then they can adjust it. And then they, then what we do see is they start in those issues that they still had or that, or that the carnivore diet created, because we don't want to think that it hasn't created problems for people because it has. For some people, and then they just add this and then they start, you know, improving. So mm-hmm. the, the copper thing That's, is more of, sorry, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Another quick tangent before we go back to the copper, cause you brought it up. I'm thinking of uh, fruit now. So you said a lot of people in that boat will go to fruit and I can understand why it tastes good. It looks attractive. Um, you know, it feels kind of nice. You're just lifting it off the tree. No animals are harmed, you know, like agriculture and all the rest of it. It all sounds very nice in theory. Um, Fruits never kind of agree to me. I know you do recommend some fruit. What's your opinion on fructose as a carb source versus starch? Oh man, this is, well, this is actually one of those things that I, that I let people's own biochemistry adjust for. Mm. Like I, I, there's, I, we use lots of different soluble fiber sources in the program. There's, there's kind of a short list of the best ones. There's in terms of grains, there's oats and barley. In terms of beans, it's just basically any normal bean, like not green beans, not peanuts, but like normal beans that you cook. Right. And then you're looking at, um, apples as a fruit. And those are those uh, there's, there's pears too, but pears have some, some little issues too. But so anyway, that that's like, I'm pretty sure I listed them all. That's the main list. Bananas are really high in potassium, but not super high in soluble fiber. Um, right. Okay. So actually, uh, potatoes can help some people with it, but potatoes are a nightshade and they tend to cause issues over time. If people over consume them or they don't prepare them right or what, all that stuff. So potatoes are a little, eh. anyway, so we have the soluble fiber thing. Now, some people like I do great. I'm actually really doing a hardcore, like tightening up of my diet to kind of do a very repetitive diet. And I'm going to be mainly a lot of my carbs are going to be two bananas in the morning, two apples at lunch, and then maybe some like low vitamin A vegetables at dinner. This is probably, this is where I'm going for this period of time. And then there'll be everything else will be basically protein. I do well with fruit and low, like low vitamin A fruit and low vitamin A vegetables. If I have too much beans or grains, I just don't feel great. Now, there's other people in our program who are doing what we call the cowboy diet. Somebody just tweeted about the other day. Um, It's just red meat and beans. Like, that's their whole diet. 
Some people have done really well with like a red, mostly red meat and either oats or even some people have done buckwheat and they've done really well with that. Buckwheat's technically a berry, actually. Um, so some people we've had multiple people doing multiple approaches and some are some are doing, you know, more fruits and some are doing more grains. Some are doing more beans. So this is where instead of having this like hard framework where I'm just going to say, well, beans are bad because why? Well, oftentimes in diet frameworks, it's the, the creator of it is like, well, this didn't work for me. I don't like this. I didn't feel good on it. So then they take it out for everybody. And we're trying, I'm not, I, I don't do that. I'm saying some people do amazing on beans and that's great. I wish I did better on them. You know, and some, some people are like, well, I, I can't do fruit. I get all bloated. And I go, well, then don't eat fruit. Like this is not, we get into the, you know, if it hurts, doc, it hurts when I do this. Well, then don't do that. Like, just don't eat that. If you don't feel good on it, don't eat it. However, I will also say that if you're on a very restrictive diet of another type of diet and you get to the point where your foods are shrinking, you know, even down to red meat. And there was a very popular carnivore diet guy who said that he ate one apple and he was messed up for three days. That's not a good sign. That's a really bad sign. That's, that means his gut biome and his bile and everything is just whacked. There's no way that an apple should lay you up for three days if you haven't been eating anything other than meat. Unless your gut biome is, just goes ape shite from it. <laughs> so that, that's where we, we, and we see people's diet tolerances go up. We see a lot of their food sensitivities go away. We see a lot of their, their um, intolerances go away. But then they also get to the point where they go, if they eat a, like a high vitamin A food, they recognize and they go, I didn't feel good when I eat that. It doesn't mean they're intolerant of it. It means they're recognizing toxicity and their body's going, this is not good for us. Just you can eat it, but don't eat it if you don't want to feel bad. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, the reason I was asking about fructose is because a lot of people say that it's a strain on the liver. And because you're so focused on the liver, that's why I was kind of curious. There are multiple diets that they use in the research, that the scientists use in the research to induce what we call cholestasis or bile leaking into the bloodstream, which is the whole basis of toxic bile theory. There's multiple diets that they use to create it. One of them is a very high fat diet. The other one is a very high fructose diet. And by high fructose, I believe they're using more like purified fructose. They're not using fruit, which is typically more like half glucose, half fructose. So, um, yeah, so they, they can, they can damage the, that's why when, when people get into like the 30 bananas a day where it's like tons and tons and tons of fructose and no protein. Oh, the, the third diet, I'm sorry, the third diet that they use to induce liver problems in that these cholestasis is low protein. So we've got high fat, low protein, high fructose. Okay, so, so what, what do we do to approach this in a way that is like fairly normal and makes sense and is somewhat natural? Well, we don't use added fats if you don't have to. We try to minimize added fats, which gets rid of the PUFA problem. It gets rid of all these extra fat-soluble toxin problems. And it just, so, so we're, we're not, it's not necessarily a low fat because anybody who eats beef is not on a low fat diet. <laughs> it's just, it's not going to technically be a low fat. So it's not a low fat. It's just a low, it's a minimal added fat. Okay. So we avoid that problem. Fructose, right? Nobody's, if people are eating whole fruit and they're also eating plenty of protein from other sources, it's really, really hard to like way overdo fruit. You know what I mean? And, and then we're not adding sugar. So added sugar would be the biggest problem. Like not unlike those people out there who think white sugar is a health food. That, that's just insanity. That's crazy. But so, you know, if somebody says that me eating, let's say two bananas and two apples in a day is some crazy amount of fructose, I'm just going to kind of chuckle and be like, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm thinking more of the kind of people who are drinking like, you know, a couple of liters or quarts of fruit juice a day, yeah. you know, that's no, that's going to yeah, a lot of people are recommending that that's going to absolutely be a problem. I mean, there was a proposal to the world health organization for, or no, to the, to the American, I think it was to the American, uh, USDA to recommend 10% or less of one's calories from sugar in a day. Cause that's, that's what has been found to be the healthiest, right? 
they said no, probably because of all the soda soda manufacturers and the fruit juice manufacturers and all that stuff. They want to push the poison on everybody. So sugar is not terrible. And people, what we see in the program is we see as people get these things fixed, the copper. I did a, I did a show where I went over how diabetics had higher copper in their blood. I mean, we, the, we, most of the time we only have the blood to go by. Like they're not doing liver biopsy studies. They, they, they consider them unethical, which is, you know, you don't want to go taking chunks of, you know, normal people's livers out. Um, but all we have is the blood. So if we see that like diabetics as a whole have higher bile in their blood, they have higher vitamin A in their blood, they have higher serum retinol and retinol binding protein, we can go, the liver's just spilling all this stuff out. Um, and this is not good. So then what, what happens with what we do is we have people who come in the program and they have, they have blood sugar problems. And at the start, I'll tell them, like, you, you, you're having trouble regulating your blood sugar. So at the start, you may not be eating a lot of these high-carb foods. Or you may have to just kind of keep, keep an eye on it. But as we fix your liver, which the funny thing is, is right with diabetes and blood sugar problems, everybody obsesses about the pancreas. The liver is, the, the pancreas actually has, is connected to the bile ducts. And so if you have toxic bile refluxing, it's going to go right back up and irritate the heck out of the pancreas. I could show you in pancreatitis that that's, that's the inflammation of the pancreas is from the bile. So, so the pancreas problem is actually caused by the liver. So as we fix the liver, we see these things in the blood come down because we're sealing up the leaky bile and there's just less of it going into the blood and there's less bile going back up into the pancreas, and we see blood sugar stability improve. So sometimes at the start, we have to go, it'd be like somebody had a cast on their leg. You shouldn't run yet. You'll be able to run eventually, but right now, you have something that's not working well, so maybe you don't run yet, but you will run soon. And then they just adjust whether, you know, some people feel amazing on starchy foods. Some people feel much better on sugary foods. Some people, some people can take obscene amounts of fiber and they feel great. I have some people who at the start, they like, they can hardly do any. And like an example of the fiber thing in the research, one of the funny things I came across in the research, I was looking at a fiber study and I was saying fiber was really, really good. I was like, okay. And then I, I read a little further down the study and they said they took out anybody who had a negative reaction to the fiber. <laughs> and so of course they got that's I mean some people might say well they were trying to find that result I mean obviously that that's so so there's the people who say the fiber fixes everything and then there's the people who say fiber is the demon and I go the answer is you know different people are going to have that's that's why you get these like gurus who say everybody needs to eat the way that I fixed myself and that's what we don't do so but yeah fructose too much fructose is a problem but I really just don't have I don't see as big of an issue with, you know, a couple pieces of fruit a day. That's especially if somebody knows they tolerate it well. I'm not going to be eating rice. I don't tolerate rice. Like a weird thing for me is if I eat rice and then I drink some water after it, I will be burping up the rice into my throat. Why does that happen? Is that a common thing? No, it's not a common thing, but I don't like it. And it makes me think that my body doesn't like rice. Okay. So I just don't eat it. It's not that difficult. Um, Letting people, giving people permission to listen to their body is what we, what we do. We have a framework, try to stay within this framework and within this framework, you listen to your body and then that's, that's what we go by. I get your nutrient needs met, which I know you're very focused on. Yeah. So, which brings us back to copper. So let me, uh, I know I went on a million tangents. Oh, I go myself, on the tangents, but... that's not your fault. <laughs> well, I did a few as well, but uh, yeah. So let's go back to that first question. Is copper an essential nutrient? Have you made up your mind for certain about this? That is one thing I have, I have not put my, my hammer down on that as of yet. Um, I don't, I, I will put it this way. The people in the program who are finding that copper is one of their biggest issues. It seems that it's taking a lot longer to detox the liver of copper than it is to detox it of vitamin A. When we, we started out, we were full force on vitamin A. And as we got the vitamin A out, I started seeing, especially when some people would go into like what we call the bile dumping phases or whatever, especially women were going, I'm getting all these copper toxicity symptoms when I dump. And 
Oh, gosh. Um, they actually look a lot like potassium deficiency symptoms because copper tends to deplete potassium. So we've got fatigue. Anxiety is a big one. Irritability, depression, trouble falling asleep initially. Um, well, a big one is any kind of um, issue with the sexual organs. Libido, you know, um, menstrual cycles, prostate issues. Like the funny thing is, so like with men with prostate issues, it's known that zinc and selenium help with prostate issues, right? You know that. Yep. Zinc and selenium are both copper antagonists. Funny coincidence, right? So we just see that copper, copper has a really big affinity for the reproductive organs. And as we start, and here, the weird thing is, okay, so as, as we all get exposed to more toxins in our lives, whether that's, you know, shots or pharmaceuticals or other toxins or, um, you know, just eating a, a toxic diet that somebody didn't realize was toxic, you know, too much vitamin A, taking vitamin D supplements, any of these things that can damage the liver. So as we damage the liver more and more, the kind of like if you drive a car more and the car gets dirtier and dirtier and the parts get worn more and worn more, the detox system gets slower. So then you start accumulating more toxins and maybe something that you weren't exposed to too much before. Like let's say your body could handle getting rid of it before. Now all of a sudden your detox is slowed down and you start accumulating it more because your detox system has gone down. So as we go, the, the funny thing is, is I see vitamin A toxicity and copper toxicity together all the time. When we go and we look at the research on birth control pills, since 1975, it has been known that birth control pills will raise vitamin A in the blood and copper in the blood together. They go together. So it's kind of, that's, that's why we kind of hit both of them. The, the easier and quicker thing to reduce seems to be the vitamin A, it's easier to get that out of foods. If you're eating plant foods, then it's really hard to, I mean, like people eating chocolate because they think it's healthy for them. It's like chocolate's super high in copper, super high in cadmium. And then they, then they look back when they find my stuff and they go, oh my gosh, my health got worse as I was eating more and more chocolate. And I thought it was good for me for the copper. And now you got people pushing on Instagram and everywhere, these copper vessel like copper cups and copper water bottles. And I could show you in the research that copper water pipes have caused problems all sorts of places. Like, and they're, they're just, they're making stuff up. They're making claims up saying that if you drink out of a copper vessel, it'll do this and do this and do this. And I'm like, you have no research. And I have research on like copper water pipes, poisoning people, causing ulcerative colitis, like all this stuff. And they're just, I mean, they're just shysters is what they are. Let me just check. I thought one of the things that it does do effectively is kill microorganisms. Like, I, I, I assume that that's the reason why they used to put water in there is not because it's actually good for you, but because, you know, it will stop you getting poisoned by the water. Right. There is, there is that. Well, we, we can always replace one problem with another problem. Right. Yeah. Isn't that what modern well, medicine like, does? <laughs> bacterial poisoning is like a short-term problem, yes. whereas... Heavy metal accumulation is more of a long-term problem, so I can see that that would seem like a good idea at the time. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson, including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net.
Just to go back, sorry, as well, you know, you talked about how a lot of your clients are experiencing copper toxicity, um, which looks like potassium deficiency. How are you evaluating that? Because I know that with vitamin A, it's quite difficult to test. Like, you know, it doesn't necessarily show up in the blood for a lot of the time. Is copper easier? Are you seeing it as plasma copper or is it in the hair or how do you? We are the only group out there doing both in terms of zinc and copper. We look at um, hair test hair mineral analysis and we look at serum copper and plasma zinc the research seems to show that plasma zinc is a better indicator of it and serum copper is just it's it's serum copper is good enough it's as accurate as we need to be so we look at all of those and the 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 crazy thing is is you will have the same person doing these these tests and you can have somebody who is very low on one test and really high on the other. And it's just when, you know, I've got my own understanding of this. If I see copper toxicity anywhere, they're copper toxic. That's, that's all there is to it. And we start. So it's high in the hair or the blood. In the hair or the blood. Yes. Like if I see indicators of zinc deficiency on either of those, or if I see indicators of copper toxicity, then zinc deficiency is assumed as well because zinc is the, the main antagonist of copper so we use zinc to get it out now when you were talking about the the copper toxicity symptoms when we have lots of especially i mean we have it with men too but especially with women women with copper toxicity symptoms when they start getting like they they might have you know kind of like ex high estrogen symptoms like maybe their their breasts start getting sore or their their menstrual cycle gets off or whatever and they know they or the, the big things with women is usually sleep like they start getting insomnia and this can happen when let's say they take too much zinc for what they're ready for they're too they're too toxic in copper to take that much zinc and what i believe the zinc is doing is zinc and copper occupy basically the same space in cells. They, they, can, they can switch out the spots. So if you take enough zinc and it kicks copper out too fast, then you get the copper coming out in the bile and the bile's leaking into the blood and then they get symptoms. So we have to find the dose of zinc. Like we'll often have women say, oh my gosh, I feel great on this dose of zinc. But if I go above that, I start getting what we call copper dumping symptoms. So it doesn't make sense that it's a copper deficiency if they if they take it up here and then they go over it. Like, seriously, do we think like five milligrams of zinc is going to push somebody into a deficiency? Probably not. But if we take too much zinc and we kick too much copper out into the system, then we get a problem. The, the theory here on zinc, what zinc does in the body, and we could find research on this, is zinc protects against copper toxicity and vitamin A toxicity. And zinc is also needed to detox vitamin A through the ADH enzyme, and zinc is also needed to kick copper out, to displace copper, to antagonize copper, to get it out. So oftentimes on the, for let's say a woman is sensitive to zinc and she gets to a certain dose and it pushes her over the edge. So she feels great until a certain dose and then another dose pushes her over the edge. The idea that I've, the theory that I've come up with on that is a certain dose, they're getting more of the protective benefit. But once they cross over that threshold dose, they start dumping more copper than they can protect against. Mm. Does that make sense? So then we just we just take yeah. it down. We just say, well, here's the protective dose. Don't go up there and dump too much. Just stay here. Listen to your body. Your body says this is good. And they usually have improvements in their symptoms up to a certain dose. And I have to, this is where people who want to work with me, they're not quite used to my approach because I'm saying, you're going to start at this and you're going to slowly go up in zinc until you get to, this is your ceiling dose. Like, this is the most I think I want you to go up to right now, this six months. But your job is to test until you get to the, either the, either you get to the max dose that I give you or to the dose that causes you symptoms. And then you go back to the dose that was okay. And so it does require each person to be their own little mini scientist and they are their own little experiment. And we are trying to find the best dose for them. Like I, I had a woman completely refill her zinc stores with five milligrams of supplemental zinc a day. I have another woman currently on 90 to hundred milligrams of zinc a day. And that, that specifically improves her symptoms. Is she going to be on that dose forever? No. And I've told her this, like, this is not a forever dose. 
if you stop working with me or if you d don't test again, you are not to stay on this dose past, you know, I think probably three months or even six months at the max. And then you drop down and I gave her the dose to go down to if she doesn't test. So I take this all very seriously because um, zinc, zinc excess can happen. I mean, it, it can, but in the research that usually only happens at 100 milligrams or more a day. So once we know that, we can play around with less of it. We look at, like, let's say the hair test zinc. We look at the blood test zinc. Then we give people zinc and we watch their symptoms. If they're feeling better, keep going. If you feel bad, back off to the dose that was good. Like, so we're using multiple approaches to find somebody's best dose. And they do the same thing then with selenium. They do the same thing then with molybdenum. They're, they're doing it with, and some people like zinc will cause them to dump copper and molybdenum makes them feel amazing. And some people molybdenum will cause them to dump copper and zinc makes them feel amazing. But we don't know that until we try it. And that's why we don't want to just be like, everybody needs 50 milligrams of zinc picolinate a day. That's, we just don't do that. That's why I made a zinc drop that has two milligrams per drop so that women, espe women, especially women, but men could too, they could dose it two milligrams at a time. And they could very fine tune their dose because we're, we're trying, we're, people talk about individualized medicine out there. And I'm like, we do individualized medicine. We're letting people individualize their diet. We're letting them individualize their supplements. They're testing, they're taking things out, putting them back in and seeing how it works. It is more work for the client, but nobody ever said getting your health back in today's world was going to be easy. So if uh, a person increases their zinc a lot in the way you just described, you would see, would you see high levels of zinc in the blood and high levels of copper in the blood because the zinc is displacing it? Is that what you'd expect? We normally see in the beginning phases of getting somebody back, get, re repleting somebody's zinc. In the early phases, generally on the hair test and the blood test, as you replenish zinc, so if the, if the zinc is moving up, the copper is moving up with it. They tend to move up and down together at the beginning. As you do it right over time, what happens is then eventually we see the zinc start to maintain the up and then it goes, then the copper goes down to where we want it. So yeah, I think that's what happened to me. I mean, I'm looking at one point, my zinc was 243. <laughs> and the reference range is 65 to 160. So that definitely got high. Uh, the zinc was low. The zinc was 83. Uh, sorry, the copper was low. The copper was 83. Um, so I don't think I, based I, I have not well, had wait, my copper in my hair for years. Let me, let me add something is it, to that. Is, sure. is it possible that you took the zinc the day before or the day of the test? Did, did you uh, honestly no, avoid No, the, I am aware not to do that with zinc, iron, you know, a few. Do you have any idea of how to, much you were taking? Yes, 50 milligrams. I mean, it was pretty high, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that's obviously how I created the situation, 50 milligrams plus food source, right? I mean, that's significant. Um but yeah, uh, no, I was just wondering, because, uh, uh, you know, I, I take all this seriously, the potential for toxicity, because I have got a history with it. Certainly with the vitamin A toxicity, I have absolutely no issue having minimal vitamin A in my diet because I did a retinal test. It was above the reference range. Then I did six months of pretty much zero vitamin A. It was slightly higher than it was before. So I had exactly that experience you're talking about where my liver just started dumping it, obviously. Um, However, with the copper, I've not had that at all. As I said, um, you know, it's it's not high in the hair. It wasn't high in urine either. It's not high in the blood. Is it safe to say then that I just don't have a copper toxicity issue or is there still a possibility that I could have it and it's just not manifesting in any of these ways? But you haven't done any hair testing? Yeah, as I said, hair and urine nope. was low in all of them. Uh, it used to be high in hair 10 years ago, back when I was a vegan, but, you know. Your to, copper was higher back when you were a vegan. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, it okay. was massively, massively sense. high. But yeah, for the last few years, it has been low in urine, uh, blood, and, um, and I realize this is a bit of a niche question, maybe. Uh, I don't think it will only apply to me, because I think actually a lot of people who have been applying your advice for a long time are going to be in a similar position, right, I guess, of having all these copper markers be low. Um, so, so does that mean that, you know, copper toxicity probably isn't the thing that they need to, they need to be focused on, or are you still not sure? You may be past it. I mean, you may, you may have been taking enough zinc for a long enough time. And I mean, are you, have you been doing a fairly high like muscle meat diet for a decent amount of time? Yeah. I also did high dose of molybdenum oh, though. Well. I think that might have, <laughs> that's the thing about a significant it, impact. The thing that, the thing that is the reality that we have to have, right. Is 
as opposed to what the the wokesters say is that that men and women are actually different. Mm. Men, so I was wondering about this. Men make a lot more bile than women do. It's in the research. Men tend to have higher vitamin A levels in the blood than women do. Why? Probably because men make more bile and more of it leaks and we see more of the vitamin A in the blood. That's probably why. Um, your experience where, where you went on a low vitamin A diet and your vitamin A actually went up is saying what we, what we believe is that as you have less toxins in your system over time, you're going to make more bile. That's that your body's trying to get rid of the toxicity that, that the bile is how it does it. So as, and I actually can show research that shows that vitamin A reduces the bile production by the liver. So as we put less toxicity in you, but you're not eating it. I mean, the only thing, the only reason your blood could have gone up is because of the vitamin A coming out of your liver. How, yep. how would it, it make sense the, to me? Yeah. How would it get into the blood? Because you're leaking bile, like all of us who have, you know, in general today, we have some amount of bile leakage into our blood. And as we fix that over time, the, the leaks, as we fix the leaks, then you leak, you leak less. You'll see the retinol go down in the blood. And as you have less vitamin A in your liver, you you have less to put into the bile. So eventually it's funny when we get to the, there is an absolute turning point where people will often have vitamin A. It stays very, very steady for a long time, even years. And then all of a sudden it just drops like a rock. So two things probably happened. You're sealing up the damage and there's, you've run out of liver, you've run out of vitamin A in your liver and it's just coming down. It'd be like, it'd be like when a car a car drives fine until it runs out of gas. And then it's just like, and it just goes to zero. That's, that's likely what happens. So, so there is that the, the copper toxicity, do you have copper toxicity in your liver? I mean, if you're it, 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 in a certain way in our work, like I tell people, I don't, I wouldn't have to have a vitamin A test on anybody to help them get better from vitamin A toxicity. It doesn't change what I do. So like in terms of copper, we're still not going to have you eat like you're not. If, I mean, if you go back to eating like chocolate and a vegan, your copper is going to go right back up. It's like saying, well, I used to be an alcoholic and I stopped drinking for 10 years. What's going to happen if I drink again? Well, you're going to get messed up again because your system is, you know, it's already been through it. It's, you know, we don't need if you take an old car and you drive it hard and then you restore it. Sure, you can you can do something to it, but it's still an old car and it's probably going to break down faster than, you know, other cars would because it's already been there. Right. So, um, you know, if you have good hair testing, I mean, so really what I would do is if let's say your copper's good or low ish on a hair test and blood test. What do we do then? We just start ignoring it. And then we, then we work on keeping your zinc levels and your selenium levels and your molybdenum levels good. And then whatever happens, we, I have people who are seeing their copper going significantly lower than the, than the normal range. We're seeing this. And they're not falling apart. <laughs> and just to clarify, sorry, good, you know, like my zinc, as I said at one point, is 240, reference range up to 160. My selenium, I think last time I tested it was like 310. Wait, you said this was here? You know. Uh, no, sorry, there's blood. Blood, okay, okay. So my blood, you know, at one point... I, I these, think are micro moles moles per, per, these are micromoles per liter? Zinc was micrograms per deciliter. Uh, selenium that was, was when it was high, micro, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And my, uh, selenium, you know, that's still the latest one, micrograms per liter, that was right at the top of the range. It was, well, it was over the range. It was in the red, and? you know, too much, uh, 300 or something. And then I stopped supplementing selenium. But... Um, would you say those are good signs potentially then if a person gets to not maybe over the reference range, but near the top, I'm just kind of wondering, you know, what, yeah. what's like the, what, yeah, I don't want to make this all about me, but I guess what I'm saying is what should a person who is wanting to do this for themselves, if they what were, should they be aiming for? If they were wanting to do it for themselves, I mean, and, and cause all the labs are going to have different ranges. Every lab like makes their own range. And I, I could go over that about the farce of lab ranges. But generally what you want to assume is if you were looking at, let's say, a, a, what we consider the good minerals in the blood, first of all, don't take a supplement of that mineral the, the morning of your blood test and the day before at least. Because it will show up. Like if somebody eats a huge steak dinner the night before their, their blood test and they do a serum iron, their serum iron may very well show up high because they just ate a bunch of iron. Like you can... This is the problem with blood tests is they are very much affected by what you did the day before. 
So you just have to know that. That's why when you told me that that high zinc number, I was like, did you take it the day before? Because that sounds like if 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 you did. I thought like a week before okay. because as you said, like it, it takes a while to clear out. Yeah. Yeah. You may you may have, you know, been on a little more zinc than you needed for a while. And you, you Yeah, need, yeah, yeah. I'm sure I was. <laughs> and you may not have hit the level, but yeah, for somebody doing it on their own, if they didn't eventually I'm gonna be doing training seminars for practitioners and even lay people to read their labs like I do. I mean, maybe I'm getting a bit ahead of that. Though, no, that's but okay. I guess it's like a preview of but that. If, so, if somebody was doing it, first of all, the hair test, la the hair test ranges are complete garbage. I mean, the normal ranges for hair tests, I don't, I don't go by those at all. So I can't, I can't give an idea on that. Like I have, I have ranges for each mineral that I, that I have gone by over time. Um, in terms of the blood test, a safe thing to assume is that you want to be what's called high normal. So if you take that range and you divide it in half, you want to be on the higher side, you know, not, not maybe not high out of range, but higher than the midpoint and lower than the high end of the range. That's generally what I, that's like, that's, that's the, the, the slow man's way of looking at the labs. Like I have very specific ranges that are based on some of my copper and zinc ranges are based on William Walsh's work. Um, he was a big, big in the copper toxicity area. But he still thought that vitamin A was necessary and he gave really high doses to certain types of people. That was, I think, a huge mistake. Um, but yeah, so it's the higher, so like selenium and molybdenum and, uh, and zinc, just being high normal in those would be the first and simplest step. Yeah. And magnesium, probably highest, high in the range as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, I or red, blood, red blood cell magnesium because I know that normal magnesium doesn't really mean very much. Right. I've I've found like I can have people who have high red blood cell magnesium, like high out of range, and I look at their hair test, and they are they are low in calcium relative to I'm sorry, low in magnesium relative to calcium on the hair test, and then I tell them I want you to try some topical magnesium, and they try it and they feel better. So my, I have very little faith in red. I, I, and from what I've seen hair tests and responses by people, I red blood cell tests, at least the ranges, I don't find them useful at all. They haven't helped me. And if, if, if I see somebody who's like, let, if they come in and they're low on the magnesium on the red blood cell and low on the relative to calcium, magnesium relative to calcium, and they've been doing oral magnesium, this is a common, I mean, common enough. I tell them, look, you're, your pills of magnesium aren't working. They just, they aren't like, and then they try some topical and they feel better. I can always tell somebody that they're magnesium deficient. If you do any form of topical magnesium and you feel better, you feel some impact from it in a good way, you're magnesium deficient. I don't care what any labs say. Like if, if you're putting an essential mineral in your body and you feel better, you're deficient. That's it. So we can go by these simple logical things. And then as we get people's levels better, they stop feeling that, oomph from it that change stops happening because their normal day-to-day -day level is improved so then taking an extra pill doesn't change it it doesn't mean that they're done because whatever they were doing before that drove them into deficiency so if all of a sudden they stop completely the supplement but they were still doing the same diet it makes sense that the deficiency is slowly going to creep back right because that's what created in the first place so then we get into like when you when you saw your selenium was high and you dropped all of it. If, if I had been looking at your labs over time, I might look at what your lab was a while back when you were supplementing it at a certain level, certain, certain intake, and then look at the labs where you were high and what intake that was. And we might do something just as simple as split the difference. So we cut your dose in half. So we don't take you off, but we, we still have you on some because we could assume that the deficiency may come back. And then, then if we test again and you're still high, then we go, oh, we got to drop it further. Um, so we did, we just, this is, this is the art, if you want to say of, of nutritional medicine is, is realizing how somebody got there, how to get them out, how to teach them, how to listen to their body, how to look at the labs and realize the labs are a map. This, this is a key concept. The labs are a map where it says you're here and you want to be here. But if you look at like, you know, a, a Google maps, Right. Google Maps 
might give you eight different ways to get there. So you could have eight different people, let's say, who are deficient in zinc. And they're all going to take a different route to get to fill up their zinc. One person might not have to take any. One person might have to take what seem like really large amounts. A lot of people are going to take, you know, kind of that shortest route, which is like the normal dosing that we do. But we don't know what's going to happen until we get there. Very interesting. Well, thank you for getting the weeds of me about that. And I am looking forward to that course. That will be very interesting. Um, back to copper. So one of the things that really won me over about vitamin A was reading, first of all, reading Grant's book and having him really, uh, what's the word, tear apart the argument for each benefit that is claimed for it. And also there was uh, an episode that you did where I think you did the same thing. You went through and you had a stack of research behind you and you went through each claim about what's beneficial and you kind of eviscerated it. Would you be able to do something like that for us with maybe at least, you know, one or two or three of the, the claimed top benefits of copper? Like explain to us why, um, you know, these are fallacious misunderstandings mm. that these benefits to copper exist. Um, and I can prompt you if you like with, a, you know, an example, but I'd be interested to see what you, uh, what you would prefer to address in that regard. In my, in my live streams each week, when I go over a condition, Every, every live stream I'll be able to, I generally go and I show that there's more copper in these issues. Like there's, there's higher copper in the blood. It's the, it's the, it's the only thing I can show. Like I said, I wanted to go start and doing the, these copper liver biopsy things to show that's, that's kind of where we start to see that I've had an, I've got a thread on Twitter about the epidemic of vitamin A toxicity, but it only shows up in the liver biopsy studies. So it doesn't show up in, in the, the blood test. And then you've got the U.S. government taking off the RDA, showing the RDA of vitamin A, how much is in a thing. They, they, rec they remove the requirements because vitamin A deficiency was so low in the U.S. They considered it rare. So if, if deficiency is rare, what does that do to the chance of toxicity? Well, it goes through the roof. Now, copper is, copper is known in research to cause cholestasis toxic leaky bile. So again, that's the last podcast I did. Copper is used to cause that. So when people understand toxic bile theory, if you take copper or generally, oh, let me back up. Generally things that cause cholestasis are either they're, they're generally either damaging the bile ducts themselves, or they're damaging the liver cells that make bile because they're toxic in nature. They're just the, the very cells that make bile are damaged by the bile that they make. This is in the literature. So the more toxic you make the bile, the more damage it causes. But one of the ways that people can feel good when they take toxic things, and this goes right back to toxic bile theory, is it slows down their bile production. So by slowing down, and this is where people, they feel better and they go, oh my gosh, like, I can't, we're going to do a special, Kelsey and I, on methylene blue and methylene blue, and so we consider it slowing down detox when you slow down bile production. Methylene blue slows down detox more than anything I have ever come across. It slows down every single pathway of detox that I, that I typically try to fix. And so, but people are saying, oh, methylene blue, like I, one woman on Twitter said it was like pure crack. Like that's how good she felt on it. Another company on Instagram advertised it as it feels like Adderall. This is not an essential nutrient. It is the first synthetic drug ever made by basically the first synthetic drug ever. That's the way it talks about on, on the literature. So what do drugs do? They generally slow down and stop detox. By slowing down bile production, you dump less bile. So for a while, you leak less bile. And if the bile is the root of all of your issues in the blood and everywhere else, then by slowing down the bile production for a while, the honeymoon phase, I call it, people will feel better. Different things are going to work on different people better to shut down their bile. So let's say somebody has a certain presentation that's like what people say is a copper deficiency incorrectly. They give these people copper. Copper is especially efficient and effective at slowing down that kind of like whether it's genetics or nutrition or whatever that person's mix of things that gave them that symptom is, 
it slows down that, per, that type of person's bile production the best. And so then what happens is, so they've slowed down their bile production. They're taking in more copper, which is, so they're not making bile as well. They're accumulating more copper in their liver because it's not coming out, right? Over time, this is what we see, and there will probably be somebody listening to this right now who's going to be like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what happened. Over time, trying to force in that copper, drinking out of that copper cup or whatever they're doing, it was helping, it was helping, it was helping. And they start noticing the symptoms are coming back, but they're still doing the same thing they were doing, like the copper. And then they try more copper and maybe they get another little honeymoon phase where they get a little better for a while because they shut down their bile even more. And then the problems start creeping back and then they try to do more of it. Right, it's the definition of insanity. They, they do more of it, but we all tried it. We all did it at once. So they, they add more until all of a sudden their problems are no better from adding more and more and more. And their problems are only getting worse. Here's the worst part about it. When they stop the copper. So what was the copper doing? It was shutting down their bile production. You want to know what withdrawals are? Withdrawals are when you stop slowing down your bile production and all the bile starts dumping out again. So they stop. So they're trying to stop the copper. They can't stop the copper because they get so much worse when they stop the copper because they start making more bile and they're dumping out this extra toxic bile, which is leaking into their system and they feel the old symptoms plus more symptoms. So then they get back on the copper, but they know the copper is making them feel bad, but they can't get off of it. Does this sound like a, like a drug addiction? You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's exactly the same thing. So that's, that's what drugs do. And we actually, like an example, when I was talking about methylene blue, methylene blue, actually, we found a paper that showed that the, when people stopped it, the, their ALDH, their detox enzyme, which is related to bile, ALDH, the faster ALDH goes, the more bile you make. But they actually saw, so, so it, there's a paper showing, the title of the paper is Methylene Blue Inhibits Aldehyde Dehydrogenase, basically. So it slows down your detox. When you slow down ALDH, you slow down bile production. What Kelsey saw when she looked at it, she actually saw, she said, wait, after they stopped the Methylene Blue, their ALDH went higher than it was before. So if bile and ALDH are connected, that means they started dumping more bile. Now, one of the things that people who are ahead of the curve, who have already experimented with Methylene Blue and realized it wasn't helpful was that once they stop it after a certain period of time, certain days or weeks or whatever, all their symptoms come back full force and then are worse again. It's exactly, it fits the theory exactly. So this is what copper does. This is what vitamin A does. This is how, this is any of these things that we say are toxic that are shown to be toxic in the literature. I mean, I can show you tons of studies where they say cancer has higher levels of copper than other levels, other tissues. Cancer accumulates copper. And cancer has really high ALDH levels. Why, why do we have ALDH? To break down aldehydes, which are toxic. So copper's got tons of, I mean, cancer has tons of copper in it, and it's, it's really high in a detox enzyme. So what is cancer then? It's a toxin storage thing, and it's trying to process toxins. It's not some rogue, broken tissue. It's your body trying to save your life. And that's the best thing that it can do. It's, it's just, it's a, it's a desperate measure to try to hide to toxins and process them. And this is why the whole basis of chemo, like chemotherapy has been shown to shut down bile production. So they shut down the chemo where they shut down the liver and the bile with chemo. Then all of a sudden this cancer tissue that's made to process toxins, it stores them, but it also processes them is able to get rid of these toxins. And then the cancers go away. But that whole time, the liver's been getting more toxic. Like, I mean, the chemo's toxic. The liver's not dumping bile. So yes, you see the one condition go away or get better. But then as soon as they, they pull out the chemo, because it would kill people if they left it in too long, all of a sudden, then you see the cancer come back in more places. And then they have to give a stronger chemo to shut down the liver even more. And then they do, they do this dance until the person is dead. That's what they do. I mean, it's the fifth round of chemo that killed my dad. So I like to think my dad had a pretty good constitution. 
but I didn't know all this back then. And he's, you know, he was his own man. He's going to do his own things. We all wish we could help our family more, you know, in the end, but he was going to do his own thing. So, so that's like, that's, that's the copper thing. That's the whole idea of bile, shutting down bile to improve symptoms. So any of those symptoms that you mentioned with copper, the, the ones that they say it fixes, that's the mechanism of how it, how it helps. That this is very interesting. That toxic bile theory came about after Grant Jenneru. He introduced me to Anthony Mawson's work. Anthony Mawson's work led me into toxic bile theory. And now, now here we are. So, yeah. I think one of the most interesting things about copper to me, I wonder if you've come across this in real life, is that copper excess, if it gets sufficient enough, actually creates psychopathy in a person, which is uh, a stunning thing because, you know, this is getting us a little bit more in this philosophical area, but... Um, uh, you know, psychopathy is, if you believe in such a thing as evil, then a psychopathic person is as close as you can get to that. So it's very interesting to me that if a quote-unquote good or at least normal person builds up enough copper in their system that they can f then flip over into the dark side, Darth Vader style, and kind of become evil, That's that definitely says something interesting about how at least definitely excessive copper it cannot be a good thing if that's the case, right? I'm talking about Wilson's disease, obviously, for, for those listening who are not aware. Well, there's um, there's also a thing about in certain, uh, I think it's crustaceans, so shellfish in the ocean or certain, certain, certain ocean creatures. I don't remember exactly which ones, but they have blue blood because they use copper instead of um, iron. And so when we talk about blue bloods, right? The elites and we, you know, they're not always associated with wanting the best things of hu for humanity. And we call blue bloods and copper and all this stuff. Um, yeah, it's the, the copper thing. And, 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 and Sorry, let's just explain that a little bit more. Because, yeah, the blue blood thing, they used to um, say that that was silver. I think that was the explanation for that I mean, because the they had so much silver contact. But, but to go back, like, I think a lot of people, when they think of copper, they think of that copper color, like a copper cup or whatever. But actually, copper itself is blue that's why you're saying blue bloods i just well, there's want to the clarify oxidized that copper, yes. people like like when yeah, you like sorry, the blood's red in your system but once it comes i mean sorry it's blue it's, it's more you know bluish in your system and then it's red when it's exposed to air so copper when it oxidizes it turns blue yes so yeah um so that would be the opposite of normal right instead of red blood coming out you'd have blue blood coming out so um but copper and schizophrenia and co i mean the, the whole william walsh's thing was working on schizophrenia with uh, high doses of zinc and other things like that. So he was antagonizing copper. Um, several of the things, I mean, I was just going over yesterday uh, on Twitter, vitamin A toxicity in the literature. When you look at, th you know, active retinoic acid, which is, you know, Accutane, isotretinoin, all trans retinoic acid, these things that people are putting in their body and putting on their face. These are, these are what are considered the active forms of vitamin A. They are the exact same chemical formula. Well, depression, psychosis, uh, the desire and the ability to end oneself and schizophrenia are all associated with vitamin A as well. So if I, I, you know, I said vitamin A toxicity and copper toxicity come together, we start to see these patterns. And then the other thing that we use a lot in the program now is we use flush niacin or nicotinic acid and Abram Hoffer and Pfeiffer did tons of research where they could basically make, I, I'm not going to use the C word here, but they could help people make their uh, schizophrenia go away with enough flush niacin or nicotinic acid. Well, what is the, what is flush niacin flush niacin or ni nicotinic acid is it makes NAD in your body. NAD is the gasoline to run all of your detox enzymes and especially the ones that help detox vitamin A. So we see this pattern of these things cause mental issues. This helps fix it. And they, when we start, what I do, what I'm really gifted at is putting it all together and going, this, this all makes sense. Like this is how all these things fit together. That's, you know, that's the whole nutrition detective thing. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it, it's all connected. nutrition exorcist, maybe right, could right. be uh, appropriate, although probably not as appealing as I, mean, I, I, I had, um, I had a person who was having out of, out of body experiences. Like they were, they were, I, I forget what it's called a dissociative. They, she was having dissociative experiences and we helped her out of it. We had another guy who was having, I forget the condition, but he would, 
he would go into these fits where he would be, it would, he was shaking and twitching and he would, it wasn't, it wasn't Tourette's, but he was, he would curse at people even as they're trying to help him. And we helped him get out of it and get back to work. So people don't realize that. So, so the, the thing is, especially for those of you out there who are listening and who are interested is if you have what seems like a mental health issue that you've been working on, like you, you've been doing exercises, you've been doing therapy, you've been doing counseling, you've been doing whatever, EMDR, any, any of that stuff. And it doesn't seem to hold and it doesn't seem to stay. Maybe you can get it improved for an hour or a day and then it comes back. The reason it's not staying away is because your chemistry is what drives what's going on for that situation for you. Like a lot of people, they, when they get hypoglycemic, right, they get really angry. And, and if that got really bad, it could turn violent, right? So what if, the, if, if somebody gets angry and eventually could potentially get violent if their condition gets worse? What if we just fix their toxicity and their blood sugar stability? And then all of a sudden, is that a problem anymore? No. So it, I kind of look at it as nature and nurture. Like the, the nature is like your chemistry and the nurture is how you think about things. So can we work on both? Of course. Is it good to work on both? Of course. But are meds going to fix anything? No, they're not going to fix anything. They're going to eventually make it worse. I actually have a study showing that um, SSRI, it's Prozac, specifically slows down vitamin A detox. It, it actually says retinoic acid catabolism is slowed down by Prozac. Well, if it slows that down, it means it slows down your detox. If it slows down your detox, it slows down your bile dumping. If it slows down your bile dumping, your improvements from the SSRI are because the bile's not going into your blood and then affecting your brain. And this is why when people try to get off of SSRIs, it's so hard because they start dumping all that toxic bile into their system again. Let me clarify this about toxic bile theory. As you yes. uh, spoke about it a lot this episode after all. So when these toxins are not being dumped into the blood because the bile production is slowed down, where are they going in that intermediate they're phase? Generally... Is that where they're accumulating in the liver? Or are they accumulating in fat cells? Are they accumulating in the bone? All of the above? Something else? Well, I mean, like, the research shows that lead can accumulate in the bones. Um, obviously, fat-soluble toxins could definitely go to the body fat or the liver. Um, if we start seeing fatty liver, we know we're storing lots of fat-soluble toxins in, in the liver. And, and so, or when we hear about enlarged livers right? Why is the liver getting bigger? It's to store stuff, right? So that's, I mean, that's, that's the reason. Um, so where it, generally the liver, I mean, the kidneys, I did a whole thread on Twitter about, uh, kidneys accumulating toxic metals along with the liver. And I, I went through all, I mean, there was cadmium, there was lead, there was arsenic, there was, you know, forever chemicals. I went through all of this, like don't eat organ meats, folks. They're not, it's not good for you. It's just not that. So, so, but generally if we're, if we're slowing down the bile, the simple way to think about it, if, if we're slowing down the bile dumping, it is going to go eventually somewhere. Think of the liver is going to hold as much as it can. The, the bones are going to hold as much as they can. The, let's say you have a, let's a person has a ton of problems with stiffness. Well, maybe your muscles are starting to store it. There's um, the brain, right? We can go and look in almost, you know, Parkinson's and Huntington's and Alzheimer's and find higher levels of copper in the brain of these people. Well, so it's getting, acu it's accumulating there. But the thing is, you, you feel it if it's in the brain, right? I'm thinking more like you're saying all these things with copper or methylene blue or whatever, they're suppressing the production of bile and making you feel better. So, so where are these toxins going that make you feel better? Well, I guess it's, it's just staying uh, in the liver. If it's, if it's in the liver, it's just staying there. But eventually, just like anything, like if you, if you plug up something for long enough, and it's developing pressure behind that. It's either going to blow out, which would be like when people have flares of things. Like we're all of a sudden, you know, they're going along and they're like, oh, I'm in remission. And then all of a sudden, blam, it just comes out. That's when that's like, that's the finger blew out of the, the plug, right? You got your finger in the plug and it blew out. The other thing is, is where people slowly get worse over time is you get back pressure, right? And so if you get enough back pressure, then things blow out backwards. And that's where we get things like intrahepatic cholestasis, which means from within the liver, you're leaking bile straight into the blood. So the liver cells are blowing out. 
the the little teeny tiny bile ducts in the liver are blowing out. These are the people who, in my opinion, in my experience, are the sickest. And they're the ones who are the most sensitive to trying to do anything where they're like, I react to every medication. I react to every supplement. I react to, I can eat like three foods. Like what's going on is anything you put in there that's either bad for them or good for them. If, if it increases their bile dumping, it blows back into the system. If it slows down their bile dumping, they already back blew it back out. So it's, it's going to go like the body will try to make bile. It will, it will keep trying and trying and trying because it knows that this is the only way it's going to get better. And as we get people better and they start, sometimes they, they start feeling they're getting better and better and better and better. And then all of a sudden they're like, why do I feel worse all of a sudden? Well, there's, there's this concept that I have where the body kind of gets better enough that it starts making tons of bile because the liver's just like, I got to get out of this situation. I feel better. The liver's just like, I feel better. So we're just going to make more bile. You can just deal with it. And I think I'm in that situation without being gross. I've noticed like my BMs are like really green these days, which I think is a bile thing. It's like it's always green. And it's like, and I haven't had any, I haven't consumed anything green in years. So I'm like, what, what else can that be? So I think that's the phase that I'm in. I've called it, I've, I've called this places. I, I don't like to talk about this too much because I think people start to think that this is happening. You know, so you've been doing these kind of principles for a while now. Right. Yep. So I just don't like for people to, to think that they, this happened too quickly to them, but it is, um, I call it, uh, cracking open the liver. And it's like, as we, as you do enough good things when we, I mean, I, I'm, I've always been kind of blessed with looking at things from multiple angles and, and trying to do all these angles at the same time. So we're doing all these angles of fixing toxicities. We're doing all these angles of fixing deficiencies. And so we're hitting it from multiple angles. And as we get to this one turning point of the crack, I call it cracking open the liver. Like the liver is just not so toxic. It's got enough nutrients. It starts dumping a bunch of bile. And usually at this time, people have been feeling better all the way up to that. They, they usually maintain those improvements, but something doesn't feel good. They're like, wow, I, I was feeling so good. And now I'm not we have to actually kind of ramp it back because it's like they're, they're making so much bile that we actually, the good news is they're making so much bile on their own. We have to tone down the things that we know increase bile dumping. So it's, it's like a sign we're getting better. We, we don't have to do as much. We actually have to ratchet it back. Isn't that what everybody's after, right? Everybody, everybody wants to be after. I want to take fewer supplements. I don't want to have to do all these things to feel better. you know, they don't want to, we are getting people to the point over, over years, this is a marathon, not a sprint, but we're getting people to the point where they actually purposely have to do less, which can be hard for supplement addicts because there's plenty of people out there who are total supplement addicts. And they think that if they've gotten on one pill, they're going to be on it forever. And we're kind of like, um, no, <laughs> you're not going to have to do that. And actually at some point, certain supplements that were good for you at one time may start to be too much and we have to ratchet it back or you'll just keep making yourself feel bad. I noticed what ramped up for me, for instance, was red light. And now, you know, sunlight, for instance, like that does it. And that's something that, yeah, so I'm like, yeah, I can't do it too much because it'll just create too much. Yeah. 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 It, it, and different people have different triggers. Over time, you'll likely get it, it right now. That may be an issue. Once you get past this, then that issue will go away. One of my big bile dumping symptoms used to be a, a, a li really stiff lower back in the morning. And I think it was, I think it was the bile hitting my kidneys. And when I did my, my labs that I put on YouTube, there was one marker that was out of range and that was the, I think it was creatinine and that's a kidney marker, right? So now the creatinine is back in range and within, a, I, I think within the last month, I think two months, two months, there was a specific time where I went, wait, I'm waking up and my back is not stiff anymore. And so it's like, I think I got past whatever that we fixed, whatever that bile leak was or the toxicity of the bile went down and all of a sudden that symptom just went away. So this, this is what we see over time and people just go, well, why did this go away now? And I go, because you cross some threshold. It's, it's great. Isn't it? And they're like, yeah, there's, they want to know why. And I go, I, you'll never know <laughs> all I, all I'm just here to get you better.
I'm not here to explain why. Yeah, I think that, you know, people start off getting into health because they just want to be healthy, but then they kind of confuse the the means with the end and they're like, oh, I want to follow this diet or I want to, you know, whatever. And they forget the original reason is just because they were in pain or they didn't have energy or whatever <laughs> was the actual the initial thing. I think that that's kind of a human condition. I think that happens with everything. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. I want to ask you about a couple more nutrients. Um... So one of them is manganese. I believe that you're also not a fan of manganese. I, I have literally no knowledge about that. And again, it's something that was right at the bottom of the reference range in my test. And if I didn't know you, I might be like, oh, maybe I should take a little bit more manganese. But I thought this time, let me ask Dr. Smith. And of course, this applies to everyone. So in the sense that everyone might be taking manganese and that it's often in a multi-mineral or it's in a multivitamin. Um, so can you please tell us, we don't have to go into much details really about coffee, but please tell us a little bit about manganese and why it's uh, not something you maybe want to supplement with at least. Yeah, the simple thing is manganese is used to induce cholestasis in certain studies. Manganese levels are found elevated in cholestasis. They're, it, it accumulates in the liver. It's not something we want more of. So in, in our program, we don't necessarily think about it much. It's just don't supplement it. And don't go trying to eat foods in it. Like don't, don't, don't pursue it. So it's like, don't, don't take supplements with it in it and don't pursue it. This, this is the way we do with a lot of things. It's like, it's like with, uh, in a certain way with fats and oils, like don't supplement fats and oils. Don't add a bunch of them, but you don't have to avoid fat in foods like B6, which is another alcohol and aldehyde. Another thing I don't think is a vitamin. It's, it fits in the whole alcohol aldehyde like vitamin A does and like rat poison vitamin D does and vitamin E does. We just, we don't supplement it. We just, and we don't try to pursue it. So that's, that's, that part of that approach is because, you know, we don't, we all live in the real world and there's only so many factors that we can account for. So I, I, I'm not here to over, I mean, I, I give people enough homework to do. I don't need to give them more, but yeah, manganese is not, you start looking into a lot of these things that people say we need. And then you start going into manganese deficiency symptoms and nobody hardly talks about them. They'll be like, oh, it's in superoxide dismutase. And I then come back with, well, maybe the superoxide dismutase is, is attached to it to protect us from it. So it's not free and floating around. You attach an antioxidant to this thing that might be going around in a, in a way badly oxidizing things. And that's why there's a superoxide dismutase that binds to copper. And so we see these superoxide dismutases tending to bind to things that I generally don't like. And I believe, yes, there is a zinc superoxide dismutase, but you know, it's these, these rules are not always, it's not, they're not always rules. Um, so yeah, that, that's definitely, in, manganese is something we don't want. Again, I think, was it Parkinson's? If you go and look up Parkinson's and high manganese in the brain, you're going to find this right there. Like, we, we don't want these things. And you can find lots on manganese toxicity out there. So it's just, it's just another one that we don't want. Okay. Now, that's a little bit obscure. I know one of the things that a lot of people watching this probably are more interested in and maybe taking and are a fan of would be some of the other B vitamins. So you mentioned B6. You know, I, there is research definitely about how that can create neuropathy and other symptoms in excess. And the excess level is actually not necessarily that high compared to what's often in supplements. 
But um, what about B1? A lot of people are a fan of that. A lot of people notice benefit from that. Uh, I, I'm just going to list a few, and you just discuss any that you actually want to. So what about B1, B2, uh, uh, folic acid, folate, and B12? Let's let's just focus on those four. I think a lot of, there's people who are fans of all of those specifically and claim that they can heal you and all the rest of it. What's your opinion on those? Um, do you first of all, I think, I guess, do you think they're essential nutrients? And then second of all. Um, is it a case of, you know, you're fine people having it in diet, but you wouldn't want them to supplement it because you think, you know, that's excessive or what, what's your take on those? So let me, let me hit each one of those quickly. Cause I know I, I talk a lot in these things. So B, B12, ah, B12 is really, well, first of all, you, you all should know that the American chemical society and Merck love to congratulate each other on all their B vitamin science. Now, if you love, if you think Merck and the American Chemical Society getting involved in nutritional medicine is a good thing. And they're congratulating themselves about B vitamins that, you know, you might start to go, something doesn't smell right here. Um, but so we get into B12. Now, an interesting thing on B12 is so we don't avoid B12. Like we, in the program, people are eating muscle meat, like if not every meal, almost every meal, whether it's red meat or poultry or whatever. So we don't avoid B12. Now, when I see people mega dosing B12 and they say they need to do it, I say something's wrong. Something's very, very wrong. If they say they got pernicious anemia, which is an autoimmune condition where they're destroying their own intrinsic factor, which is supposed to help transport B12 across, autoimmunity is a toxicity condition. So if they have pernicious anemia, I just say you're toxic. There's something causing this problem that is causing you to need this, this mega dose band-aid crutch. What about uh, something like macrocytic anemia, which I think is more common that they will also blame on B12 and folate. Right. Um, well, what, what do we know? One of the things in the literature is that B12 is a remedy for hydrogen sulfide poisoning. Oh, uh, interesting. One of the things we don't push on the pro on the program much is we, we, tr we generally try to reduce or minimize sulfur sources away from meat. So how could you give yourself hydrogen? If you've ever had sulfur farts from eggs or from like cauliflower or cabbage, you're making hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is considered one of the biggest things that makes bad breath. We as humans don't like smelling hydrogen sulfide and it's a problem in our body. Now they're trying to come out with research saying hydrogen sulfide is some important messenger in our bloodstream. Like they're just trying to tell us that all these toxins are good for us. Hydrogen sulfide is a deadly gas. Like you don't want it in you. So B12 is an antidote for that. So one of the things I tend to, I tend to think is that especially if somebody needs mega doses of B, B vitamins, of any B vitamin to feel good, like mega, mega doses, they're toxic in some way. And it's band-aiding or, or it's a crutch or a band-aid for some toxicity that they have. Now B12, just a quick thing. If, if I were to take apart the B12 molecule, Cobalt is a toxic metal. This is known. Cobalamin, cyan, you know, any of the cobalamins, cobalt's a toxic metal. If we get into the, the um, amine molecule, the cobalamine is what it really means. All three parts of that molecule, there's three major parts of it. Every one of those by itself is generally considered toxic. So we have three toxic protein parts on a toxic metal. It starts to look really sketchy. But can these things, is it a hydrogen sulfide remedy? Yes. I actually poisoned myself. This is a story I've told on my live stream a bunch of times. I poisoned myself with MSM, methyl sulfonyl methane, what they call organic. I used to a huge dose of that like a decade ago. Yes. Yeah. I know what you mean. Did you get messed up from it? Uh, yeah, I think I did. See, I got messed up from that. And what, so here's, it's a quick, funny story, but I messed myself up. I was taking, I think I took 10 tablespoons the last day I took it. Something like crazy like that. Um, cause the guy who was working with me told me if you feel detox symptoms, just take more, it'll make them go away. And I believed him. I think it was just, it was, it was God meant me for me to go through it. So I got to learn the stupidity of doc. It hurts when I do this. Well then don't do that. Like I was feeling worse. I felt amazing for like the first week and then everything started going downhill and I followed this guy's advice to take more. And I got, it's the worst I've ever felt in my life. It, by, after, by day 10, it was the worst I'd ever felt in my life. I talked to Stephanie Seneff, who is, you know, she's, she's pretty smart lady. She goes, 
I told her my symptoms and she goes, it sounds like you have hydrogen sulfide poisoning to me. Like, that's what it sounds like to me. And I went, okay, thank you very much. Like I, that was just a, you know, closed the email. I'm off on hydrogen sulfide research. I find that B12 is a remedy. I order because I have the ability to, I order tons of B12, like 200,000 micrograms in vials. I have a student from the clinic at my office. I'm like, you're going to run an IV on me of B12. I ran a hundred, uh, the first day I, I didn't have the IV. I injected 70,000 micrograms of B12 sub Q into my belly, into my shoulders, into my glutes. Um, and I had really strong B12. It was 5,000 micro or 10,000 micrograms per mil. It looked like blood. Like it looked straight up like blood. I did the IV. I, I mean, I did the, I did the injections. The first day I was better by like 75% peeing fruit punch color. Like <laughs> it, seriously, it was, I was in the bathroom going, wow, this is crazy. So then it's I like purple, I, right? Purplish red, definitely a purplish, a reddish with a purplish to it. Um, so, so I did, I did the IV the next day. I was, I was like 90% better, but, it, and so it made sense that I was hydrogen, you know, B12 is a hydrogen sulfide remedy. I took a hydrogen sulfide remedy and B12 and MSM is a sulfur. It was turning into hydrogen sulfide in me. We fixed the problem. So then I went, I'm that, that was the start of me realizing that sulfur is not a good thing for us. Um, so there was, so B12 is, I just look at it as maybe we need B12. Like we don't need to avoid B12 in foods, but if somebody needs mega doses of B12, there's another problem that is not being dealt with. So if someone's deficient in B12, despite having a normal amount from food, that would indicate that they need more B12 or they're becoming deficient in B12 because they have a problem. Or, or their liver is messed up. Okay. That's usually what we go back to when people have chronic problems. Especially, you know, the more common problems are with high stuff, like we see high iron, high copper, high vitamin A, more, more common problems are high. And that's a, it's kind of like, if you think of it in terms of labs, it's kind of like obesity. Like there's too much of things. But when people get into the low stuff where they have like, let's say they come to me and they have low vitamin A and low copper and low um, ferritin. And they tend to be underweight. Well, the research actually shows that being chronically underweight puts you at risk of dying sooner than, so obesity will kill you sooner than normal, but being chronically underweight will kill you sooner than obesity. But that's much more rare. It's still a problem of the liver. It's just, it's further along. It's, it's, it's a deeper problem. And so it, it manifests differently. I explain it to people like this alcoholism. Generally, most people get fat in the beginning from when they're drinking lots of alcohol, but there's a point where their liver breaks. And then all of a sudden, then they get that really skinny look, right? They can't keep any weight on. They got the toothpick arms and the toothpick legs and the big hard belly. That's, that's when things have gotten, they've crossed the point to the underweight side. So they went from the over to the under. Neither of them is good, but the under is actually worse. So anyway, so, but, but if somebody tried, let's say somebody has low B12 and they get some B12 shots and they don't feel a damn thing. The B12 is not their problem. It's something else. It's the same thing with, with women who have long-term iron deficiency anemia and they don't have heavy periods and they're not bleeding and they're, they're eating red meat at least once a day, every day. It's not an iron deficiency problem. It's in their liver. And we fixed it because we fix livers. That's what we do. So, so there's that. So then let me go to B1. B1 binds to aldehydes. Aldehydes are toxic. B1 binds to them. So, when, yeah. So I don't, I don't know. It just, it, it, that's, okay. that's the I, I definitely think it does in the gut. Yes, yes. I just, I just went through the research and I, I was like, I think it binds to aldehydes. And I found research showing that it did bind to aldehydes and it, and it made sense. And then what we've seen on the program is let's say people who benefit from B1 in the beginning, I don't tell people not to take it. I just say, if you want to try it, try it. If it helps, you take it, you do the rest of the program. And as we get you better, then at some point you're not going to need it. And then you get off of it. And this is what we see. So this is where the, the idea of the benefit of B vitamins 
is actually as antidotes to things, mostly antidotes to toxins that are already in you. And then when you fix the toxicity, you don't need the B vitamins anymore. And that's, that's what we see now. B2, um, another guy on my, in the, in the new love your liver program, Ludovic did a big thing on B2. B2. I just don't think I, I, I don't, we don't put people on it. I don't generally see that. It's crazy how B2 is the one that really changes your pee color, right? Your body doesn't want it. It's peeing it out. I generally don't trust very yellow things, and B2 is very yellow. So that's just, we, we don't tend to use B2 on the program much. When people do it, maybe they do a little bit. It helps, you know, maybe they got the stomatitis, you know, the, the, the lip cracking thing, and it helps. So, you know, I, I used, I, I had people with those symptoms. I tried B2 on it with just about everybody. Maybe a third of the people responded to it and the other two thirds it didn't respond to. But that's supposed to be like a classic symptom of B2 deficiency. But the B2 didn't work. So what is it? It's probably some other toxicity or deficiency. Um, so there's B2. Now B6, alcohol, aldehyde, toxic. We don't use it. Definitely accumulates in the nerves. They're on Twitter at B6 toxicity. She's, she's the specialist on it. Um, but we just don't, we don't supplement it and we don't, Try to eat more of it. And, there, and, and B6 toxicity can absolutely happen from a normal diet. There are plenty of normal diet people who have gotten B6 toxicity from eating just high B6 foods. Um, so what were the other ones? We did B12. We did uh, the, B the last one's folate. Folate. Folate is one that I actually think m may be a legit, a legit vitamin. Um, we tend to, I, I believe that the people in the program don't tend to have any folate problems, especially if they're eating lots of meat and lots of, uh, and lots of beans. Like there's not a folate deficiency. If people are folate and flesh niacin do actually work together. So we do want to make sure we get enough of those to run things. Kelsey knows more about that pathway than I do. Um, and again, if we had somebody try, I, I like, okay. The funny thing was, was I like folinic acid or it's also sold as calcium folinate. Funny thing, the FDA just made that prescription only. Really? Yeah, they <laughs> took that away yeah. from everybody, except except people who are going through chemotherapy. Funny oh, really? Thing. So I, you know, we, I, I never use the MTHF stuff, the, the methylated tetrahydrofolate. Um, I don't like to mess with the body's methylation. One of the biggest ways to fix methylation is through flesh niacin or nicotinic acid that does actually repair a lot of the methyl problems. Um, and that's, I could go into the, the over methylation and under methylation and all that stuff, but it, I, I was an over methylate or an under, under methylator and the niacin, the flesh niacin took me out of that based on the flesh niacin testing that you can do. Um, but that's a whole nother story. So, so that like corrected your homocysteine or something like that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, well, one of the one of the tests, one of the old tests for your methylation status is mm -hmm. to take like 50 milligrams of flush niacin and see if you flush. And if mm -hmm. you flush at a low dose like that, they consider you to be, I if I recall correctly, an undermethylator. Okay. Well, what if I were to tell you that I'm not, I'm not advising to do this. I don't think this is necessary, but I did this to prove to myself that flush niacin was safe. What if I told you I worked my way up to 15 grams, 15 grams, 15,000 milligrams of flush niacin a day for a week. And one of those days I took 20,000 milligrams and I had no flush by the time I got up to there. So how, how did I go from 50 milligrams and flushing hard to where I didn't, I didn't really enjoy it. I wasn't used to it yet to 20,000. And now all of a sudden I'm not flushing at all. So it's, it's very interesting. But is that definitely desirable? Cause wasn't Linus Pauling's research that like schizophrenics were able to have way, way higher doses of niacin and not flush. Like they needed several thousand milligrams. The, the theory that, that. Kelsey and I work on is that, you know, you, the only place you feel the flush is your skin, right? You don't, you don't feel the flush anywhere else. So, so what the niacin is doing in your skin is, is I, the TRPV one receptors are involved, like temperature receptors are involved and all that stuff. 
we don't have those. Like you don't feel your brain, right? You don't feel, generally you don't feel your liver. Okay. So this is going to sound silly. Where does a schizophrenic have the biggest problems? Right? It's their brain. Right? So where would the niacin do most of its work? Probably in the brain. Do you feel your brain? No. So the idea is that the niacin is going to be used up in the places where it's needed the most. Oh, I see. Okay. Needs it in their brain. And, and the rest of us, we, if, you know, if we're storing toxin, enough toxins in our skin, I, I believe that the flush is a, a, an accelerated detox of vitamin A specifically in the skin. And I could show that showing acute vitamin A toxicity has the same symptoms as a flush. Uh, sunburns have the same symptoms as a flush. It's just those take weeks to go away. Whereas the niacin flesh comes and goes. And then somebody just on the Love Your Liver Network the other day said they did it. And all of a sudden, there's, I think they said they had eczema. Their eczema was just so much better after the flesh was gone because their skin was less toxic. And we did talk about this a lot on the previous episode. So for anyone who's interested in diving into that more, we, we talked about it a lot there. I want to ask you about one more nutrient, if that's okay, Dr. Smith. And I'm sure you normally ignore comments, um, but there was one that piqued my curiosity in the level of it's not understanding you. And so I wanted to bring it up because they said that you were criticizing vitamin D3 and you didn't acknowledge that vitamin K2 would address a lot of those issues with D3, that it would stop the buildup of calcium in the tissues. And I, my reply is like, as far as I'm aware, vitamin K2 is the only fat soluble vitamin and one of the only vitamins that Dr. Smith is actually a huge fan of and, and, you know, recommends, I think, in a lot of cases. I know it's case-by-case -case basis. Um, so could you put the record straight on that and give us your perspective on K2 and also why you feel that it doesn't, that it's not sufficient to stop the calcification of tissues that vitamin D3 causes? Well, I have posted a study before where they gave people K2 with their D3 and they, I'm sorry, they had a group they gave just D3 to, and then they had a group they gave D3 and K2 to. And these people already had car carotid calcification. And they gave them the K2, and they noticed no change in the calcification of the arteries. So it, it didn't work. Okay. Then if people are saying, you, if people have to take, if they're saying, well, you have to take K2 with your D3 to prevent problems. Are they not saying that vitamin D causes problems implicitly by saying that? They, they just admitted it causes problems. You have to protect yourself against this vitamin D that is used in rat poisons to cause hypercoagulation like blood clots in animals by dosing them too heavy. So we see that. Then we have, okay, so I have the research showing that vitamin A depletes K2. I think I have three studies on that. In one of the papers, the authors said it is very obvious that we can use vitamin A to create a simple deficiency of K2. They just said it's just like it's like just add them together. Do the, the vitamin A, it'll make the vitamin K deficient. Okay. How how in the world did humans like if we think everybody's like, well, you gotta eat these dark green leafy vegetables that like no, no free living human out in the wild would waste their time and energy on green leafy vegetables. There's no calories. Like, why would you eat those things? They're bitter. There's no calories. They're not good for you. So, so nobody would be getting vitamin K from dark green leafy vegetables. And then they'll say, oh, you got to eat cheese. Well, I'm sorry. Cheese is not a natural food for humans or anything else. So if we're supposed to have to eat vit these foods to get vitamin K, what, what in the world is going on? Okay. What we see in the program. So some people, do I use vitamin K2? Yes, I use the MK4 version. I do not use the MK7 version. That's a long explanation with, with um, Bacillus subtilis, which is, if you search for Bacillus subtilis and the word sewage on PubMed, you find 36 studies. Uh, it's a, it's a sewage bacteria. I'm not going to use it. This is why natto natto is so nasty because it's a sewage bacteria. That's why it tastes nasty and looks nasty and smells nasty. Um, so, but MK7 is made by Bacillus subsalis, which is 
sewage bag. And MK4 is the type naturally found in animal food, right? MK7 is bacterial fermentation. So, so I like yeah. MK4. Um, and I, I will supplement it in people. I, when I talk to people in my consults, I'll say, well, do you have uh, easy bruising? Do you have um, bleeding gums? Do you have sensitive teeth? If you got a nosebleed or a cut, do you feel like it takes longer to stop bleeding than it should? And usually people kind of have a handle on one of those. And then if they have diagnosed osteoporosis or diagnosed osteopenia, or they know they have a high coronary calcium score, then I'll give them the option of taking vitamin K. I let them know that what we have seen as we go along is as people get better, as we are doing what we do, the symptoms of vitamin K deficiency that they had before will go away eventually. We see it. If they don't take the vitamin K, will those problems eventually go away? Yes. If they do take the vitamin K, can they resolve some of those symptoms quicker? Sure. Why not? I mean, it, it helps. Like people will rub it on their bruises and the bruises go away a lot faster. They rub it on their gums and their teeth. I like to use drops. I don't use the pills. So, I mean, we, we offer pills but I like to use the drops. I'm working on my own um, liquid vitamin K currently. Um, but so they can just do it faster. So vitamin K I do like. I, I would like it best if their own gut made it, their gut bacteria, because that's, that's, that's what is supposed to make it, is your gut bacteria. If your gut bacteria is messed up, you don't make it. And then you got to eat things like cheese <laughs> or, or dark green leafy vegetables. And so anyway... We've helped a lot of people with vitamin K supplementation. And then what we see is over time, they don't need it. That's, but we're also trying to get the vitamin A out of them, which is what made the vitamin K deficiency in the first place. So mm. it's it yeah, all very interesting. <laughs> well, that's awesome. I think we've covered most of the vitamins and most of the minerals in one form or another today. So that was like a bit of a masterclass, a bit of a breakdown. And it's very interesting, you know, usually when we talk about uh, all of these nutrients, it's, you know, what's usually focused on is what they do in like a positive sense in terms of you need it to make this and to do this function, all the rest of it. It's very interesting to see your perspective is like the opposite, which is actually it helps to, uh, you know, maybe address this toxin or, you know, uh, reduce this toxin or speed up the processing of this toxin. Um, or it just is a toxin a lot of the time. <laughs> it's actually, you know, making things worse. Um, just to kind of finish, uh, would you say that, what, what is your theory, if you're willing to share it publicly, on why toxicity is so under-focused on in the uh, mainstream medicine, but I guess even alternative health to a large degree? There are some people who focus endlessly on doing detoxes, but often that's fasting. It's having a lot of green juice and all that kind of stuff that you wouldn't recommend anyway, but they're not they're not kind of getting into the woods of actually, you know, identifying what is toxic and excluding it in the way that you're doing. Um, what is it you think that makes people focus more on, well, anything other than identifying these toxins? And uh, do you think there's a conspiracy behind it? Do you think it's something about human nature that we don't want to focus on? You know, thinking that a lot of these foods or supplements or drugs or whatever are bad for us. What, what do you think it is that makes us resistant to this paradigm? And is there anything you can say to help us embrace it? Because I think for a lot of people, it's like, oh, God, another thing I can't eat, another thing that's bad for me, another thing I can't do. How can we reframe this for them to, uh, to make it more like empowering or, or um, I don't know, enjoyable? Jeez, I wish, I wish there was an easy <laughs> way to put this. Um, the, the first thing, it's, it's a challenging question. So sorry. It's, it's a, it's a, that's a big question. Like there's a bunch of things in here. So, so first of all, I think there's, there's the fact that, and I've, I've talked about this before is that people have to take responsibility wh wherever they are in their health, however it happened. Like they could have been born. If you're, if you were born jaundiced, like your liver was messed up when you were born, which means it's probably been messed up your entire life. Okay, it is what it is. What can we do now? It means that the person has to take responsibility for where they are right now. They can, they, it doesn't matter what happened in the past. Some people love to focus on that, like the victim mentality and like, I've always had this. And that's, that, that may be true. It may be absolutely true. 
but nothing happens until you decide that you want to, to change things and move forward. So that's a lot of people don't want to take responsibility for their health and say, you know, the reality is that some of these things may have been done to you. Like a lot of us had shots as kids and that, that may have caused quite a bit of problems. I can't, I, I had some, I can't change it. I can only do better from here and then not do it to the next generation and then fix my problems and fix any problems that, you know, my kids might've had. I didn't do that to my kids just by the way. But so there's that. Then there's the idea. A lot of people who are especially like, let's say the sensitive types overly easily offended, stuff like that. In a certain way, if you say that toxicity is a problem, you are telling these people that you are dirty and they will absolutely not accept that. They're, I'm not dirty. You can't say I'm dirty. I'm unhealthy because I'm dirty. No, that, that they just, they just turn it into their heads that toxic. You're saying you're toxic. And then everybody's like, well, I'm not toxic, you know, or toxic masculinity or whatever. All this, the, the, the toxicity word is just, it's kind of like, it's loaded. It's a huge loaded word. So you're, when we say somebody's toxic in a certain way, when we talk about toxic masculinity or all these other things, we're saying you're bad, you're dirty. And so people don't want to do that. The next thing is like, if people were to realize that tox, the main thing that it's done, just so you know why I'm concentrating on toxicity here is because the, the most impact if people were to say, well, what's more important to eat high nutrients or to eat less toxicity? The most important thing to do is to eat or take in less toxicity, because if you take in more toxicity, you get more toxic. If you take in more toxicity, you need more nutrients. So you're worse off on both ends. If you take in less toxicity, you're less toxic. Your body's able to get rid of more and you actually don't lose nutrients trying to detox. So you get ahead. So if, if somebody said, which would you rather work on? What's more important? less toxicity coming in. That's more important than more nutrients. I mean, we, we want to do both. Like, why would we not do both? But if we had to pick one, the toxicity exposure is more important. Okay. So then we get into if conventional medicine and even alternative medicine were forced to admit that all these problems are toxicities, it will absolutely crush them because they've been denying it and ignoring it and all this and all these other things like they they contributing to it contribute. right yeah and then then you start going okay so why do these toxicity get bad and then you go well this medication slows down the liver this medication slows down the liver this vitamin slows down the liver you just go boom 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 boom, boom and they go but that's all the stuff they tell us to take and we go yep exactly it's almost like there's a plan to poison us that is grander than anybody can imagine. Sometimes I sit there and I think of this stuff and I go, I, I can see, I can see much more of this than just about anybody sees. And I go, this is actually like, I mean, Bill Gates favorite vitamin is vitamin A. I have a whole thread on Twitter about this. He gives out free vitamin A in third world countries. He helps the world health organization to give vitamin A immunizations shots to kids. He's working on genetically modified vitamin A foods. So anybody who goes, well, but that's synthetic vitamin A. I go, what? So the, the vitamin A in a GMO banana is going to be naturally produced, right? It's in the banana. That's the same thing. It's the same damn thing. Um, so we start going, well, that seems interesting. Um, and then if people don't like, you know, Bill Gates because he likes the shots, well, then we go, well, he also likes ivermectin and he also likes vitamin A. Wow. Weird that he's on both sides of it. Interesting. So seeing all this stuff, it's just, it's just, I mean, people have to, not everybody is suitable for my work because they have to take responsibility for learning about this. They have to have the strength, the internal strength to do this in spite of the entire internet telling them that they're wrong and all their family going, what are you doing? And then they're trying to get people to join in. And the people are like, I don't, I don't know. You know, maybe the person has the, the guts to do it and all their loved ones and their friends are like, no way I'm not going to do it. I tell, I tell people 
if if what what I'm doing here today resonates with you and you want it, you're interested in looking into it. Like, don't try to drag all your friends and your family into it. Do it yourself and get better first. And then they'll come to you and they'll be like, what are you doing? You know, you can be like, oh, yeah, I used to have allergies and now I don't anymore. And they'll be like, wait, wait, my allergies are terrible. They're getting worse. What did you do? And then you tell them and you don't have to sell them on it. Just tell them like they say in marketing, right? You got to hear something seven times before you believe it on average or before you'll buy it. Give them the seven times like they're, they're, you know, maybe some people jump on after two times. That's how long it took me to realize that Grant was right. I had to see it twice. Um, but some people, it might take 14 times. That's how you get an average, right? So that you just, it's, this work is going to affect the entire paradigm of medicine. It's going to affect the entire paradigm of nutrition. It's going to affect Every, it's going to affect industries, like entire industries, when people start realizing that like these foods are bad for them and all the things they were sold on as superfoods, and it's just it's just garbage. So it it would topple entire industries. It would make a huge difference. I think that's really interesting. It's a bunch of very valid perspectives. Um, one thing I'd add to it is I think uh, for most people, especially if they've had parents which rightly or wrongly they've grown up to kind of trust and believe so i think people who have a respect for authority figures really struggle to understand this stuff because they just believe the government wouldn't do that these companies wouldn't do that these whatever wouldn't you know like if they're saying it's good like they wouldn't be poisoning us that's that's not possible and you know i had not great upbringing and i think a lot of people who i uh, speak to in this world they're the same and i almost think if you've had a bad upbringing, it does give a lot of negative outcomes. But the one positive is that you learn to not trust and question authorities. And in this world that we're living in, that's actually a massive advantage um, because a lot of them do not have our best interests at heart. That's, you know, the, the, the simple fact of it. And the degree to which they do not have our best interests at heart, is there a malicious conspiracy to poison us and kill us? I mean, it's hard to prove and there's so many people involved, it's hard to judge in each individual case, right? But can we say that most of us, most most of these people don't really care about our best interests, at least based on everything that we're talking about and the abundance of evidence? There's pretty solid evidence for that. But I think emotionally to swallow that concept that these people who we put all our trust and faith in, the, the people, you know, the, the ones creating the regulations to make sure that we're safe, the ones that are you know, creating the regulations to say what we should be having and what we shouldn't be having and all the rest of it, that they, at best, don't care about our well-being at all is a bit of a built of pill to swallow. And I think that is one of the uh, reasons. But I think all the reasons you get, just gave there make sense. I think not wanting to feel that I'm dirty or there's something dirty about me or inside me is a big one. I think, you know, I talk a lot about the psychology system created by uh, Wilhelm Reich and uh, expanded on by Alexander Lowen. And, you know, he said the, one of the most common personality types and the one that's massively more common these days is a type who feels like they're missing something. There's like an emptiness inside them and it needs to be filled up. And so, of course, if you have that psychological type, you're naturally going to think the problem is I'm missing something, right? And that's why you're looking at different diets and different Growing supplements and, and all the rest of it. Pills, right? <laughs> Rather than thinking, oh, maybe is the problem I've got too much of something. That is... It's not intuitive, maybe for most people, as you just said, but especially not for this type that's very common in this day and age that feels like, you know, they're, they're missing something, there's not enough of something. So, yeah, uh, I think all the reasons you gave are good. The, the, those are two, like, further um, ideas that came prompted as a result of it. But, yeah, that's very, very interesting. Dr. Smith, we've taken up a lot of your time. I really appreciate it. This has been fascinating. I always learn a lot, but I've learned more with this one than the last one because I already was aware of a lot of what we talked about last time, although I still learn very interesting all the stuff about niacin and all the rest of it. Uh, tell people um, how can they find you? Um, where would be the best starting place if they're not already familiar with your work? Well, sure. If you're on Twitter, um, which is where I do, I do a lot of posting on a regular basis. That's it's Nutri Detect, N U T R I D E T E C T. Um, I have a YouTube channel. I do a live stream every week. Um, 
I haven't, I don't, I didn't decide on the topic for tomorrow. Sometimes I decide pretty late, but, um, we do a different topic all the time there. The, if you're going to start on the YouTube channel, well, I mean, you, they could either go and see the, the lives, the, the, the podcast we did where we kind of went over toxic bile theory on the, my YouTube channel, the two videos that are best to start with on that topic, where people may want to watch those again, just to wrap their brain around it is numbers 53 and 71. Those are the toxic bile foundational kind of videos. Uh, we're up to, uh, I think we do 147th episode tomorrow. Um, haven't missed a week. So there's that. Um, my website is nutritiondetective.com. That's where people can find if they wanted to work with me on the testing and consultation packages, which is where we do the hair test and the blood test and do the consult and give, and there's six months of include six months of included support in small group zoom meetings. So people are not like thrown to the wolves and just like, go do it on your own. No, we like you, people can come in every week and ask me a question if they want it in, in these small group zoom meetings. So, and then we don't, most people don't include ongoing support as part of it. And we do. So there's that. We also have our supplements in the shop, the nutrition detective supplements. We're still, we're still getting started on that, but we have, we have, you know, no, we, we do minimal additives. If we have to do any additives, it's, it's just like, rice flour that I've, that I've screened really well. Um, but normally we try not to add any fillers or any additives to our supplements. And, uh, we got like a bunch in the pipeline ready to come out. And then other than that, yeah, I, I announce, I announce my stuff each week. You can find me on, if you go to my YouTube page, you can find, or my, or my Twitter, you can find all of my links either in the, the link tree in my Twitter or underneath my YouTube videos. All the links are there. If you want to find the Instagram and the Facebook and all that stuff. So yeah. Oh, wait, I forgot one more thing. Wait, wait, I forgot one more thing. The, the, my like bread and butter thing, the love your liver program, right? Yeah. That's, I was going to um, mention that. <laughs> yeah. Good. I was like, that's, that is okay. So the love your liver program is kind of like on, uh, kind of like my life's work put into writing and videos. And it's uh, at members.nutritiondetective.com. It is a do it yourself program. So for people who want to do it themselves, for whatever reason, it's 99 bucks a year or something like that. And you can go in and you can get all the info. There's like 2000 people in the network who you can bounce questions off of. And, um, there's other things in there, like, like the inner circle where people can, you know, join that, or there's an extra fee for that. And they can ask me questions each week in another live stream I do. And then, yeah, so that's, that's the do it yourself thing. Anybody who works with me or Nathan directly, any of my practitioners, the access to the love your liver program is included in that package so that's a lifetime thing so yeah so that's how you would get a hold of me and i was, I was just going to add uh, you know if you want the most uh, concise bite-sized chunk kind of uh, breakdown of dr smith's work um his pin tweet uh he has a pin tweet with a bunch of different threads on all these topics if you want to know about, about toxic bar theory if you want to know about uh, caffeine if you want to know about vitamin a if you want to know vi uh, vitamin d if you want to know about uh hormones etc like he's got a uh, a thread on each of these kind of interesting subjects so i definitely recommend that and if you're not kind of bite-sized chunks if you want to go in depth i definitely recommend his love for your liver program uh i think i bought this over a year ago i've been through it several times i, I often refer to it i think it's absolutely fantastic um i've only heard good things about the consultations because i'm part of that community inside there um and I'd love to try the supplements. We just talked about that earlier. Hopefully I'll be able to try some of the lactoferrin soon um, because I've heard that this is one of the uh, the best or maybe the best out there. And I'm a big fan of lactoferrin. I've recommended it before on the podcast. Um, so definitely check out that resource as well. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Smith. I really appreciate your time. It's been really fun. <laughs> it, it, it was. It was great. Thank you for having me on again. And, and if you want to do it again in the future, just let me know. I'm sure we'd love to. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed that, I recommend watching our latest episode, which you can do by clicking above. And make sure to subscribe, like the video, comment, and share with anyone who you think might appreciate it. Thank you.